thing scheduled. There's nobody else up here, so I'm happy to take anybody's questions so long as there's a question mark at the end and so long as you don't take too long doing it. And if you do take too long, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buzz you and you're out. So that's the way this works. So there are, there are microphones set up at either end. Anybody who wants to get up and ask a question, oh, yeah, there's Make America Great Again guy. He's up, up like a shot. And if the question is, how tall am I? Yes, I am 5'9". Okay. <laughs> working okay um, so I know you, I understand that out of principle you don't want to vote for Trump I get that mm -hmm. but I want to give you some facts because you know you love facts in 1904 or 1964 they said the exact same thing about Goldwater and Republicans didn't vote for Goldwater out of principle and as a result we got LBJ the, probably one of the most liberal presidents ever he created the welfare state that we still have a problem with right. today if Hillary Clinton becomes a president She's going to have the liberal Supreme Court, and she's going to be able to do executive orders to get amnesty or gun control. And the Supreme Court will not be able to stop her. And the second part of this question is, the millennials are 75% liberal right now. 75% 75 are Democrats. If there isn't eight years of Trump you know, fighting political correctness, saying that it's OK to talk about Islam or illegal immigration, saying it's OK to make fun of people without them getting butt hurt, you know, if we don't have that for eight years, there's not going to be a Republican Party in the future. OK, so there are two questions there, I assume. And, yeah, no, I understand. Are you OK with this? OK, so uh, that's not really the question. The question was the first two parts, and then there was the loaded part at the end. So here's the. Uh, <laughs> It's, so the, it's not loaded. Though. Well, it is because I disagree with both of your premises. So the, so the first premise that you have is that, is that Trump is some sort of Goldwater figure. He's not a Goldwater figure. Goldwater was an actual libertarian who believed in smaller government and constitutional governance. Trump doesn't believe in any of those things. So it's one thing to say I'm not voting for Barry Goldwater out of principle. I don't know what the principle would be you wouldn't vote for Barry Goldwater. I know all the principles you wouldn't vote for Donald Trump. He's not a conservative. So to equate Goldwater with Trump, look, look, Goldwater, I, I've actually made this exact argument about not backing Trump, meaning that, and, and I made this argument actually in the primaries about Cruz, who I thought might lose to Hillary, right? The, the, the argument that I made is sometimes you have to go with the constitutional conservatives so that in 16 years you can get Reagan, rather than going with the guy who is a, a lifelong Democrat who switched for five seconds so he could run for president. So that's the Goldwater section. The second, the second part that you asked was about you know, Trump fighting political correctness. Yeah, there are actually three. There's the Supreme Court point also. No, so that, actually the biggest point is that there's not going to be another 16 years because there's right. so many so this Democrats is, So Okay, so this is, so this is, this is a legit, so, so, there's, so there's a lot here. So let, me, so let me unpack one quick part of it. So the, the second part of what you said was without Trump fighting political correctness, then we're all down the tubes. Mm -hmm. I think Trump doesn't fight political correctness. I think Trump conflates all of the stupid things he says with being politically incorrect. I think that there are a lot of people, I, I hate political correctness significantly more than Trump. The great orange God King won't even say that men shouldn't be able to go into women's bathrooms. Okay, Donald Trump says that it's politically incorrect to insult the disabled, but it's not politically incorrect to say that transgender men are actually women, right? I mean, that's, it's, it's, it's nonsensical. I'm, I'm very much a part of the crusade against political incorrectness. My problem is he conflates political incorrectness with things that he says that are not politically incorrect. As far as the, there's not going to be a country in four years argument, this is actually an argument, right, this is an argument that I actually respect, I just don't agree with it. Meaning that if your timeline is the next four years, if you think this is the last stop on the train, and we're either on the Hillary train or we're on the Trump train, right? And in four years, we're either... LBJ 2.0 here. Right, okay, so if, if, if your argument is that there's no, that, that the only thing that can stop any of this is, is Donald Trump... I don't even think that's, I think honestly we're screwed either way, but at least I, 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 it might be a little bit worse right, so, of a fall. So, so I, I, I agree with you, we're actually screwed either way. My point is that if we're going to actually reverse what happens next, we can't have Trump as the leader of the conservative movement, not only because he's toxic, but also because he's not actually conservative. He's a European far-right populist leader. And what I would like to see is I would rather come back in four years with somebody who's actually conservative to make arguments that are politically incorrect. I'm not sure there was a candidate in the field capable of doing that this time, which is why I think Trump won. There's not going to be anyone in the future to do that either, though. I, I don't think that's true. So that, there's your question, but I, I appreciate the question. All right. My question is on uh, freedom of the press. We've seen uh, Barack Obama uh, clamp down on the, the press with the tapping of uh, James Rosen from Fox News and uh, AP, who was actually a, a friend of the administration right. and even sending Secret Service to the Blaze Studios in Texas. Um, and uh, obviously Hillary, she'll probably just keep, keep this going, and mm -hmm. Trump has threatened to do it. Uh, you know, in yeah, he's threatened to change libel law, yeah. So I'm curious on... Uh, between the two, the two candidates, where do you think uh, freedom, of, uh, freedom of the press stands I mean, within the next four years? Yeah, I mean, nowhere good. I mean, I think that, that Donald Trump has demonstrated that if you don't agree with him, he's very much willing to use whatever power he has at his disposal to target you. I mean, I, I do think that it's a very 
I think it's a, a ridiculous thing that Trump has said, basically, he'll target Amazon.com because Jeff Bezos owns Amazon, as well as the Washington Post. I mean, that's absurd. And his contention that Amazon doesn't pay tax is also absurd. And, and, the, and the idea that he bought the Washington Post as some sort of tax write-off against, against Amazon is, is patently insane. So, the, so you know, he's not going to be any great shakes on the press. Uh, but I don't think Bush was any great shakes on the press. I don't think that Obama's great shakes on the press. I think Hillary will be the same. I think that, uh, what I, here's what I would like. I, I wish that the press were, I wish that the press were as negative toward every president as they were toward George W. Bush. Right? I, want the, I want the press to be brutal to every politician there is because that's the only way we hold their feet to the fire. That's the media bias question. But as far as which candidate will be better for the press, I don't think either one of them very much likes the press unless they're favored by the press. I, I, I don't think Trump has any respect for that, neither does Hillary. Thank you. Uh, I too am convinced that we're heading towards inevitable bankruptcy if, if the left isn't defeat, defeated. Mm -hmm. um, but with regard to our having our brand tarnished forever by supporting somebody like that, the Chinese protests don't work against them for their invasion of Tibet because they don't give a damn. Well, also because they're a communist dictatorship and they literally run tanks over people. Barack Obama proudly stood in front of a mural of Che Guevara and had his photo taken. He wasn't concerned about his brand being tarnished forever. Right. Because he doesn't care about his criticism. Right. So what we're doing is we're just giving in to the critics okay, by so saying, I say that if we could support Stalin to defeat Hitler, we can support an orange-haired carnival barker to, de <laughs> to, to defeat Hillary. Right, so, I, so, this is, so the, the Stalin-Hitler argument, this is one of my favorites that people use. And, I, and it's not, like, it's a buzzword, but it is a little bit of a buzzword. So when people, when people say that side with Stalin to defeat Hitler, this seems to me a lot more like side with Hitler to defeat the communists in 1932. Right, the fact is that you don't know which one Trump is going to end up being. I mean, Trump is an authoritarian who doesn't believe in the Constitution. So I'm not saying Trump is Hitler because no one's allowed to say that Hitler was anything except an evil monster who was outside the realm of humanity. But the reality is Trump, could, Trump is an authoritarian who doesn't believe in constitutional boundaries. And so it looks to me more like we're, we're not defeating. It looks more to me like here's the analogy I'll use. OK, this is my, my analogy. And this is you know, not a buzzword. So here's my analogy. My analogy is I said this in the debate with Sally Cohn earlier that what we have here is, is, is Barack Obama took the country, we were going toward the cliff at 30, now we're going toward the cliff at 90, right? He put the pedal to the metal, and we're in serious trouble, Thelma and Louise style. Hillary Clinton is going to push the pedal to the metal even further. We're now, we're now really moving toward that cliff at 120. Trump will move us toward it at 100. He'll make it worse than Obama. He's not going to improve things, okay? He doesn't have the capacity to do that, but it'll be less bad than Hillary, right? There's only one problem, which is I think he's going to rip out the reverse shaft. I think his capacity for the conservative movement to come back after Trump hijacks it, the president becomes the leader of the party. We all know, we're all still fighting the legacy of W, right? We all know this, right? This is why this last election, that's why the guy who just won the nomination said that George W. Bush was basically a war criminal who was responsible for 9-11, right? And he won the nomination. So we all know that, that W became kind of this tarnish on the Republican brand. Trump would be that times, times 10, because he's not a Republican, because he doesn't have any centralizing principles except for his own self-aggrandizement, and because you don't know what he's going to do. Listen, maybe he gets elected. Maybe he becomes Ronald Reagan, in which case I come out and I do a full mea culpa. You guys were all right. It was all terrific. If he doesn't, what I want to know from the Trump people is what could he do where you would say this was a mistake? Right? What could he do where you would say this is a mistake? Or would you just keep saying, well, at least he's better than Hillary? Because that only goes so far. If you want a party that's not Democrats plus just a little bit, at some point you have to stand up and say this is a party that stands for something aside from just beating Hillary Clinton. Right? If you give up principle in favor of victory, I think that you're going to end up with neither principle nor victory. Damn, you're making too much sense. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, that is a, I have to say, that is a stellar mustache. <laughs> it's... <laughs> So two questions related to policy, not like Trump or this election. The first oh. one is, you mentioned about healthcare in your debate with Sally Cohn. Yes. So talking about Obamacare, now the Republicans finally had a proposal that is in the House that is to replace Obamacare, but we have other like two different lines that the Republicans are like pursuing. So HSAs, tax credits, or just going back to the standards that we had before mm -hmm. 2009. Which is your preference? Like what are the, of the three lines or you have a separate choice? And the second question is, why don't we learn with the things that are going wrong in, with Latin America? Because like in Latin America, all the populism that Trump is proposing yeah. for trade wars were implemented in Venezuela, in Brazil, in Argentina, 
uh, the default on the debt, uh, the debt in Argentina, right. Brazil with inflation, the countries are screwed now. Right. Okay. So I'll start with the, the Latin America question. The reason that America has a problem learning from other countries is because we have this concept in the United States where people don't know what American exceptionalism means. This is my problem with Trump. It's my problem with Obama. It's my problem with Hillary. American exceptionalism means that the principles upon which the country were founded are exceptional. It doesn't mean that you're exceptional because you were born here. It doesn't mean that you get to implement the same policies that Latin America implements, but somehow it has a different ending because you were born in Burbank, California, instead of being born in Caracas. That's nonsense. And what, what I think people have fallen into, and you hear it from Obama all the time, Obama says this all the time, well, we're America, and we'll, you know, we're America, and America's always going to be great, and no matter what, we're all going to be great. The arc of history bends toward justice. You know, that, that kind of bullshit. And when, and when, when he says that stuff, you know, there's the, people tend to resonate to it because they think that we're all going to be great, but it ain't going to be great if you try the same ideas. But it's this, it's, that really is, when I say that Trump, and, and there's this whole, it's not just Trump, there's this, that, there's this whole jingoistic aspect to a lot of Americans, that's not me ripping on patriotism. Patriotism means something. It means you stand up for the founding principles, not that just the borders matter only, because what's inside the borders matters more to me than where you draw it. So that's, so that's, that's, my, that's my, you know, critique of, of why people don't take the lessons I mean, listen, we had, forget Latin America, we had this lesson in Cuba, in the Soviet Union. We had a lesson in California for the rest of the country. I mean, this place is turning into a hellhole, right? And everybody's standing around going, well, if you do the same thing California did, maybe it'll be different. So that, that's, that's number one. As far as the Obamacare argument, my optimistic vision of what's going to happen with Obamacare is that I think Obamacare is actually going to be the death of government-run medicine. Because it'll take a little while, but it'll happen. Because what's going to happen is the reimbursement rates from Medicare and Medicaid are going to be so low, doctors are going to stop accepting it. Mm -hmm. And instead, they're going to start accepting cash. And the insurance companies are going to be bankrupted, which is, which is sad because people do need catastrophic health insurance coverage. But people are going to start doing their normal, their normal hospital visits in cash. Mm -hmm. And so what's going to end up happening, my, my wife's a doctor, and what's going to end up happening is that people are going to start accepting cash, and then there will actually be profit incentives for people to become doctors again. Because what's happening right now is that there's a tremendous undersupply of doctors, less people going into the profession, lots of people dropping out, too much paperwork. Talk to any doctor, they'll tell you this is true. The only way to make healthcare better in America is to create more supply, as I said, and the only way to do that is to create more profit incentive. You wanna create more supply of anything, you have to create more profit incentive. If you're gonna make money off of something, you do it more often, right? So, the, so I think Obamacare is, is, is gonna leave a lot of people in the lurch because the costs are gonna be high and the insurance company's gonna go bankrupt. But in the end, you'll end up with a cash system and then we'll revolve, devolve back to a, a private system. It's been happening, by the way, in Canada and in Britain and in Israel. Is this is black market system that, that is completely, it's like a shadow system that exists. Like if you have cancer, you don't go to the public health care system in Canada. You find a black market system and you go find somebody who actually knows what they're doing. Uh, my question is pretty simple. You've made your feelings on Hillary Clinton pretty clear. You think she's a criminal. Yes. You've made your uh, positions on Donald Trump pretty clear. You think he's a steaming pile of human garbage. Right. So, and I get That's that. A, that is a direct quote, and yes. I appreciate it. Uh, and, and I get it. I get what you get. No, never, Trump, uh, never Trump people don't want. Well, my question is, what the hell am I supposed to do? Right. So, it's, so make up your own mind. Is, is, uh, you know, the, my, here's my, my view of this. Uh, you've heard all the arguments. You're capable of deciding whether or not you think that the short-term priority of electing Trump over Hillary outweighs the long-term priority of not allowing Trump to take over conservatism in the party, right? That's really the balance. That's, that's it in a nutshell. You can make your own decision on that. I've made my own decision on that. I fully understand people who disagree. Um, you know, as far as, as what you should do, you know, I obviously think I'm right. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing it. So, it's, so, it's, so you know, I think that more than anything else, more than this election cycle, the one thing I would say to people is... Every election cycle, the temptation is to try to win over trying to stick to principle. And if we keep doing that, I don't think we're going to get either. Are, and you so, are you concerned at all that by not supporting Trump, you're hurting down ticket conservatives? No, I actually think the opposite. I think that, I think that if there are people who are not like me out there saying that Trump is a shit show, then, then it's going to be very difficult for people down ticket to do well. And I think that it's, ask people who are running for Congress. People who are running for Congress right now are having the roughest time with Trump. Because every day, instead of being able to talk about their district and what they're going to do, they have to answer why, you know, what do you think of Mexican judges? Yeah. You know, and, and it's, it's really difficult if you're, if you're running for Congress in a swing district in Oregon, for example. So, it's, so you know, I don't think turnout, I don't think tr Trump is a real drag down ticket. And this is why Paul Ryan said to his own people, do what you need to do. Right? If you want to maintain your seat, do what you need to do. Maybe you're in a Trump district and it'll help you. Fine, back Trump. If you're not in a Trump district and it's not going to help you, feel free to say, I'm not backing that guy. I think he's terrible. Right? And then argue your own case. Hey, Ben. It's good to meet you. It's good to be here to talk to you. 
Um, I hear you and Mark Levin often consider yourselves a constitutional conservative. So let me ask you a question. Is it more about party? I'm a 32-year-old veteran, Navy veteran, so I feel well, like- Well, thank you for your service. No, no problem. <laughs> My question is, is it, I'm not a Democrat, I'm not really a Republican. Is it more about party or is it more about the country? Because I see a lot of politicians, pundits stump for Mr. Trump because it's all about Republicans. Is there gonna be people like yourself to push maybe for a new brand, a new party, or some way to kind of reinvigorate the Democratic, Democratic and Republican party system? Yeah, I mean, I think that this is, a, this is a practical question as to whether it's easier to retake the, the leadership of the Republican party or to start afresh somewhere else. Um, and, uh, you know, my opinion is it's easier to take over, excuse me, the leadership of the Republican Party because there's so much infrastructure, there's so much money, there's so many operatives that grabbing hold of those levers, if you can get it, is going to be significantly more uh, effective than trying to start something ground up. Ground up takes a long time. Now, that said, if the Republican Party continues to do what it's doing, there, there's not going to be a choice. I mean, there's, there will be a third party if, if this continues because the Republican Party doesn't stand for anything now except for we're not the Democrats. And if you, and if, and if, and if, we're not the Democrats, just mean we'll back the guy who gave the Democrat money. <laughs> then uh, there's not a lot left there. Appreciate it. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Hi. Uh, first of all, I have to say, having heard your health care comments, I have to say you are one of the most wildly optimistic people I've ever heard. <laughs> I, there, uh, my impression is that there's going to be a bill in the Senate. It's going to be sponsored by Chris Murphy and Elizabeth Warren, and both of them are going to say that doctors must accept Medicare and Medicaid, and it will be ruled constitutional by the Supreme Court. That's definitely a possibility. Merrick Garland on it. That's definitely a possibility. Um, my question actually relates to some of the comments you made earlier about uh, a third party. And sure. actually, previously on your podcast, you've said before that um, Trump will in some sense smear the conservative brand. Mm -hmm. That despite the fact that Trump is not a conservative, he will forever smear conservatism with his name. And if that is the case, you know, Republicans had to fight off the legacy of Herbert Hoover for, right. for decades and- And Nixon and yes, and, and, and W. And Trump is going to be 10 times worse. Yeah. And the only problem with that that I see is then why are you so opposed to the notion of a third party? That if it is actually the case that the Republican Party and mm -hmm. conservatism have become unelectable as a result right. of Trump, then why are you so adamant that there shouldn't be a third party to oppose the Republicans and maybe do some kind of rebranding that it's, is not Trumpism? Right. No, totally. So, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a really good practical question. The question is, is it easier to, to rehabilitate if you just cut loose the Trump, the Trump part? So what Trump has done, as I said effectively, is no one identifies Trump with Bush brand conservatism. Right? Nobody identifies him that way, because he, he ran against Jeb. By the way, I think that if Jeb isn't on the stage, I'm not sure Trump is the nominee, because all he did in every debate was just tr Jeb would stand there and say something milk toast, and then Trump would look at him and then punch him through the nearest wall. <laughs> so you know, I think that if there's somebody who's, who comes, I think that it's imperative that if Trump loses and loses big, whoever's nominated next time should have the ability to say, I think it'll be important, will have the, to, to have the ability to say, well, I didn't back that guy. So when Hillary Clinton says, or you know, if she wins, God, uh, it's so uh, it's also horrible. Uh, if, if she if she uh, if she wins and she says in four years, you know, you don't get to stand there and tell me about about bigotry and racism, right? Because you backed Trump. The person can say, well, no, I didn't. He gave you money, right? That's 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 a that's a better comeback than no, I backed him to stop you and, and all that. But it's it, you're you're right. It's a consideration. It's it's a, it's definitely a balance. Thank you. If we have uh, four to eight more years of democratic policies, do you think it will be easier for us to point out the fact that their policies are not working for minorities or uh, anybody, really? No. Uh, and, and how do we go about making that happen? I think 50 years of failed democratic policy should be enough for us to say these people suck at everything. But, it's, uh, but with that said, um, I think that Republicans make an enormous mistake in their approach to these issues generally. Meaning that every argument that we make is always an effectiveness argument, right? We always say, oh, well, Obama, he just wasn't effective on the economy. And you saw Sally Cohen in the debate do this, right? He has 53 straight quarters of, of increase in job growth, or whatever it is, you know, the, the, the 53, 53 months. So she, you know, of increased job growth. And so we say, no, her, her, his economic policy has been really bad. And even I did that today, and I fell into the trap a little bit. What I should have said is, his economic policy is actually evil. Right? Forget about effectiveness or not effectiveness. You don't get to confiscate my money just because you and your friends vote to take it. Right? That's, actually, that's actually theft. So what Democrats do, and they do this routinely, is they 
turn every political question into a moral question. And this is what we all understand, right? We all resonate to this. As human beings, you resonate better to the fairness argument than to the, okay, she says the economy is better, I say the economy isn't that much better argument, right? It's just a boring argument. Nobody, we can, we can bring our statistics to bear and we'll argue about it, but it doesn't really make much of a difference. Right, what does make a difference is the moral argument. The Democrats have basically just been, this is why, I'll give you my, my grand 30,000 foot theory of why Republicans haven't, have won one presidential election since 1988. Right? The reason that Republicans have won one presidential election since 1988 is because the Soviet Union fell. The reason that is, is because until the Soviet Union fell, Republicans ran on the proposition that the greatest threat to world peace and decency was the Soviet Union, and the Democrats ran on the proposition that Republicans were the greatest threat to world peace and decency. And when the Soviet Union was around, and they had nuclear weapons, and they were going to nuke us in, in, the, in the name of communism, Republicans could say with, with ease, well, I mean, they're saying we're really bad. How about those guys over there who are slaughtering tens of millions of people and taking over countries? The, once the Soviet Union fell, and once there was no kind of ever-present bad guy outside, the right never turned to, no, the real threat to humanity is the left, which it is. I mean, the real threat to humanity is the left, because the left is evil. Um, and... and because they don't do that, we're arguing from a disadvantage. We're arguing from an imbalance. We're saying, you know, ask, just look at the Democratic debate, and you'll see, we, we all laughed at it, and we thought it was ridiculous, but this is why they win. They asked Hillary Clinton, name your enemies, and she said the Republicans. And they asked the Republicans, name your enemies, and one says Iran, and one says Russia, and one says China. Ask most Americans, who are the people who you worry about on a daily basis? And it's not the Russians, or the Iranians, or the Chinese. Right, the people that they worry about because the Democrats and the media have pushed them to worry about it are people like us. Right? It's conservatives who, who sit around and, and they want to take away your rights and stop you from having sex and take away your condoms and, and stop you from killing your babies and all this kind of stuff. So the, fact is that, so the fact is that if you want to fight on this level, they're making character arguments, we're making efficiency arguments. Character arguments always defeat efficiency arguments. Hi, uh, yes. Um, my question is, uh, I feel like it might be a little bit more personal. But um, what do you think about the uh, um, places on the internet like uh, Slash Poll? Uh, do you know about that at all? Not familiar, no. Oh, um, I'm talking more about the keyboard warriors who, uh, who I know have insulted you in different oh, things. Oh, like, like the Reddits that. and the 4chan? Yeah, like the, yeah Reddit yeah. and 4chan. Because um, I feel like they kind of started almost like a political revolution online of um, getting rid of PC. But I just wanted to see what you thought about them. I mean, I think they're mostly losers who sit in their mother's basements and smoke pot and masturbate. Um, <clears throat> you know, but it, it, so I, I think that my, my, my biggest problem with, with, the, with this group of people is that there is a, again, I've spent my entire career fighting against political correctness, right? I'm the guy who goes to public high schools with, under, with, 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 with poor kids and says to the poor kids, the reason your parents are permanently poor is because they're bad with money and made bad decisions. Don't make those decisions and you'll do better. Right, that's politically incorrect, and that'll get you shut down by the high school principal, right? Which, which happened. It, that's, right, that's, that's political incorrectness. It is not political incorrectness to shout cuck at people. Right, you're not actually changing anything. I'm sorry, just shouting cuck at people doesn't make the world a better place. It just means that you're an asshole. Yeah. So, it's, so, the, so the idea that, it, it, so, you know, my, my big problem with this is that there's a whole generation of young people who are falling into the trap of thinking they're principled by saying stupid things, and not just saying stupid things, because right, cuck is just a silly thing, but, but people who are using the N-word in chat rooms because they think, oh, I'm violating some sort of societal taboo and that makes me cool. Yeah, well, that's not going to be so cool when it turns out your employer can search you yeah. and now you can't get a job. Right? It's not going to be so cool when you fall into this trap of associating with all, with all these folks and it turns out that it's on your Facebook page. Right? It's all fun and games until you actually have to live in the real society where the left is, is willing to go after people. Now, I don't think the left should go after people for this sort of stuff, because I would prefer to live in a society where we can all say whatever we want, but I don't think that you saying these things promotes that, because I don't think it's important that we have a society where you say the N-word. I think it is important that you have a society where you can point out that we're not disproportionately sending black people to prison, we're sending black people to prison in precisely the proportions they're committing crimes. I think that's more important than you shouting cuck or the N-word. Right? And this is, this, is my, this is my big problem with, uh, you know, as, as you know, I have this long running debate now with Milo Yiannopoulos, this is my big problem with Milo and his entire movement, is I think that Milo is not conservative. I don't think he knows anything about conservatism. I don't think he cares about the Constitution. He says this openly. I think that Milo cares about being a provocateur. And I'm sorry, a provocateur generation is only valuable in, in standing for things that are worthwhile. It is not, it, it, being a provocateur just for the sake of being a provocateur is worthless. Provoke in the name of something real and decent, and then I'll stand with you. Provoke in the name of just being a provocateur because you're violating taboos and you're a waste of my time. Thank you.
Ben, um, I have a friend here who believes Obama has led a pretty good presidency so far, so I thought what better... Why way are you to... friends? <laughs> <laughs> I thought what better way to refute this belief than allow you to do it. Oh, well, okay, where do we start? Let's see, how much... <laughs> see, this is fun. I like repping on the left. Uh, so, the, so, so, Barack Obama has been terrible from beginning to end. He's divided us along racial and sexual lines. Uh, he's divided us uh, along every line he could find. He came in with a great promise. Because the expectations for Obama were so high and he fell so short, he's really divided America. I think he's trolled the Republican Party into irrelevance, and I think that he's taken his own party to Bernie Sanders' land. And I think that, you know, on, uh, he's done that through policy, but he's mostly done that through his style. When, when Obama was elected, there was this great hope that he was finally going to help conciliate the, the greatest conflict that has ever torn the nation, the racial conflict, right? And instead he came in on the basis and governed on the basis that if you oppose him, it must be because you are black. And if there are imbalances in terms of equality, that is inequity, right? Inequality equals inequity. So if more black people than white people are going to prison proportionately, that must be because people are racist. It can't just be because too many black people are committing crimes. Right, so the, the, he, by doing that, he's divided people along these lines, uh, and, it's, and it's, you can see it in the Gallup polls. I mean, people, people now feel that the racial conflict in the country is at, is at heights it hasn't been for decades. Uh, that, that, to me, is the most damaging thing, is that he's reverted American politics to a form of tribalism that I find very scary. Uh, in terms of his actual policy, Obamacare is destroying the medical system. It's raising premiums for people who are in the system. It's going to end up with an actual... With an actual form of care that, is, that, that really is, is just redistribution of care, uh, which is going to hurt the people who are youngest and the people who are oldest. And there's a reason Ezekiel Emanuel, who designed his Obamacare program, says he wants to die at 75. Uh, the, the, they're going to end up redistributing health care, and they're going to end up restricting it. Uh, as far as the economy, his economic policies, if you look, look at American history, every time there's a big bust, there is then a, a similarly sized boom, unless you have a massive government policy like FDR and Hoover, or unless you have a massive government policy like, uh, like Barack Obama. So on, on domestic policy, he's been terrible. Uh, he's, he's, you know, pushed, he, he's pushed government into realms it never was before and created conflicts that weren't there before. So, for example, on the gay marriage issue, my position on this has been that the government should get completely out of the business of marriage. I, don't, I think the government sucks at everything and they suck at that too. So, <clears throat> what Obama has done instead is he said, okay, let's enshrine same-sex marriage for the purpose of cramming down on religious institutions the idea that they must participate in something they believe is sinful. That's not live and let live. That's live like me or I won't let you live. Right? And that's, and that's, that's dastardly stuff. You know, when it comes to his foreign policy, his foreign policy is the worst of all of his, his policies. Uh, he set the world, I mean, it's, it's cliche at this point, but he has. He set the world on fire. His Libya war was a disaster and handed guns to terrorists. You know, he talks about handing guns to ISIS. He actually did that in Libya. Uh, he's, he talks about, you know, Syria is, is a disaster area. The, the attempt to make Iran into a regional power with the assumption that they're going to moderate themselves is utter asininity. It's just foolishness on, on, an, on an unbelievable scale. Uh, his... his handing over of, of power to Russia in Crimea uh, is, going to, is going to end with NATO possibly breaking apart because Russia is just going to continue encroaching on outlying portions of, of the NATO alliance uh, and, and, and basically say, fine, come and get me, coppers. Uh, and, uh, and he's allowed the Chinese to expand their, their realm of influence into the South China Sea. And you're going to see increasing Chinese uh, intransigence and aggressiveness because China demographically uh, is, m m this happens with every country where you have a lot more males than females. China demographically, there are 125 males for every 100 females. When you have a lot of excess young men, there's only one thing you can do with those people and that's put them in the army. And that's, and that's basically what China has done. So they're going to get very aggressive on the world stage very quickly. So every aspect, Latin America of course has become a disaster too. Every aspect of this presidency has been terrible, but when you have the media on your side, and when you're a likable fellow, and, and he is likable on camera, then those are assets that matter. And this is why when people say, you know, how could we end up with a reality TV show host like Trump running, he's the, only, he's the second one to do it. Right? Obama's the first. You, you, don't do, you don't do interviews with the lady who sat in a bathtub full of Cheerios and Fruit Loops <laughs> and then tell me about how terrible it is that Donald Trump used to be on The Apprentice. Hi, uh, I'm a Republican, and I also despise Donald Trump the way you do. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, but I guess the reason why I'm here is I'm just wondering, um, most of the reason why I despise him is because of his activities in Atlantic City. Uh -huh. And just looking at his history and what he did there, and just looking at other real estate deals he's been doing, yes. including Las Vegas. I'm just wondering, are there any, have, have people done enough research on his recent deals to look for something that which might discredit him 
So could knock him off his platform. So I think that it's going to be difficult to discredit him on the business record. His, and the reason I say that is not because everything you're saying isn't true. It is true, right? He's a business, he, he's a charlatan. I mean, Trump, when he says he's worth $10, $10 billion, I'm not sure he's worth one-tenth of that. You know, really. Uh, he may not even be a billionaire. He may be a millionaire. Uh, the, and he inherited basically $400 million worth of properties from Pops. Right. So that's, that's not, I mean, he's significantly underperformed every market you could have him compete with from the stock market to the real estate market over the course of his career. All of his debts are leveraged load and uh, are heavily leveraged debts that half of which he doesn't pay back. Um, and then he sticks his brand on them. Right? The Trump Casino in Atlantic City, he doesn't own any part of it, but it still has right. the Trump brand on it because they think it's good for business. I the mean, reason that it's going to be hard to attack him on this okay. is because the media have spent two decades turning him into this wonder kind of business, right? They, they keep it, like they've spent two decades with him on The Apprentice playing master business person. And so in the public mind, we all have, we have 100% name recognition of Trump. And so it's hard to convince people that what they think of this guy is totally wrong. The, I mean, the one thing that caught my attention more than anything else was the day after Trump beat uh, Cruz in Indiana, mm -hmm. and Cruz stepped down, on Bloomberg, I saw that a ex-executive uh, vice president at Goldman Sachs was appointed and nominated by Donald Trump. Right, to be his fundraiser. Campaign. Yeah, that's right. So Mnuchin, I used to work for the guy. Yeah. He's not, he's never been a supporter of Trump. And the reason why is because Donald has always done all of his business with Deutsche Bank. Mm -hmm. All the bank financings he's done has always been with Deutsche, never with, with Goldman. Mm -hmm. So when Donald came in and said, oh, I want Steve to be my man, I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. What's going on? Yeah. I mean, it's, so something funny is going well, on. Well, listen, I think there's a lot funny going on with the Trump campaign. I mean, if you looked at his financial reports, the fact that he spent so much money renting his own facilities and paying his own family right. members is a little bit weird. So, I mean, the, the idea that, that Trump isn't, like, he's a corporatist. He's always been a corporatist. I mean, he's in favor of eminent domain. He's in favor of government subsidies. So, it's, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't argue with anything that you're saying, obviously. Okay, okay. thanks. Ah, thank you for being here. Um, question is, in terms of what's been going on here and over in the UK with Brexit, yeah. there's this now uh, massive attention being paid to the globalization. Yes, the globalism, yes. And the, the globalists. Globalists. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that uh, these trade deals are now like the big talking points yes. in much of this election. Um, I guess w between the trade deals and the, the effects they've had on the country and, and maybe in the UK too, I don't know their stats that well. But between that and then actual like technological advances where yes. Uber's drivers will be replaced by you know, by automated drivers, mm -hmm. there will be more of a mass elimination of potential jobs of low skill workers. Right. Who, in, in in theory, who should be responsible for I guess creating a given who we have running the government now? Who should be who should be responsible for creating a plan for? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 right. million additional unemployed people. And depending on what your answer is, mm -hmm. do you just, is it more Darwinian or is it more, is it obviously not preferred, but an expansion of the welfare state? Okay, so, right, okay, so a couple of things that, and I'll just take one, we want you to ask, but I'll take it as a leaping off point. So you mentioned this, this globalism, globalization, globalist. There's this, there's this me, there's this kind of word that's being thrown around yeah. in this election, globalist, a lot. It's on, I know it's leading drudge right now. You know, the Trump is beating the globalists. Yes. I, think this is, I think this is mixing up two definitions of what globalism means. There's, there's the globalists, as in people who want global governance, like the UN and the EU, who actually promulgating regulations on people they don't govern. I oppose that, right? That's why I was in favor of Brexit. Then there's globalism in, fa in, in terms of free trade. Yes. I'm very much in favor of that, because I like cheaper products, and I think that if you make a cheaper product and I make a cheaper product, we should be able to trade with each other, and it's none of your damn business <laughs> to take away my ability to buy a product or produce a product to be sold in another nation. Right, because I'm for freedom. I'm not in favor of government intervention. As far as who's responsible, like who takes care of these people, the truth is that the economy, the, I mean, this is an unpopular answer, yeah. but the market takes care of these people because the reality is that the, the percentage of unemployment in 1900, right, when people were making, weren't even making cars, right, they were still doing horse and, what happened to all the horse and buggy manufacturers? Right, all of them ended up finding other jobs. This is what happens in a developing economy, and the economy's constantly developing. So that doesn't mean that it's going to be easy for people who are thrown out of work. It isn't. Technolo uh, the, and this has been true since the days of the Industrial Revolution, right? There, there was a whole group in, in Britain called the Luddites, and they would go around literally smashing machinery, right? They, they, because the Industrial Revolution created these machines, they were all out of work, they couldn't do the work by hand. They would literally go around blowing up machines to the extent the British government made it a death penalty offense to blow up machinery because it was bec becoming so prevalent. Well, the British economy didn't collapse. The British economy continued to grow, right? It, the, the Industrial Revolution drove the British Empire to new heights. The reality is the technological change is good for people because it means that we don't have rotary telephones anymore. We have the iPhone, and we have people who work on the iPhone both here and overseas. 
and we work on different products. Somebody, somebody tweeted at me the other day, you know, back in the 1950s, 90% of t-shirts were made in the United States. It's like, yes, so now they're all made in Vietnam and we make iPhones over here. It's better. Right? The, the, the purpose of the economy is not to create jobs, it's to create better products that we all have the power to consume. And in a country where even the poorest people have an iPhone, it's very difficult to argue that technological development and free trade have really been a, a net loss for the American population. Now, that doesn't help the guy who loses his job. It doesn't help the guy who loses his job. But unfortunately, it's your responsibility as an individual human being to cultivate skill sets that allow you to make that labor transferable. And all of these, and you can have government actors lie to you. I mean, everybody just wants somebody to lie to them in the end. When, when the government says we have a make work program or we have a government training program, none of these have been proved at any point to actually create jobs or help people transition into new jobs. Because as we all know, anybody who's ever worked a job, where did you learn to do your job? Working at the job, right? You didn't, you didn't go to a program. When I, was, when I was a lawyer for five minutes, right? I didn't, learn how to be, I didn't learn how to be a lawyer by going to law school. I learned how to be a lawyer by actually being at a law firm. And this is true for the vast majority of people. So anybody who, who lies to you and tells you that he's going to bring jobs back by shutting down free trade with China or such nonsense, he will bring a few jobs back, right, so to speak, because he'll penalize all the rest of us by making us pay higher prices. But he's not going to bring jobs total back. He'll kill the economy. So, it's, so it's, it's hard to say to people, your life is in your hands, but that's what freedom is called. Your life is in your hands, and it's not my responsibility to take care of you. It's your responsibility to take care of you. It's your responsibility to take care of your kids. And I'll give you a helping hand if you come to me and you show me that you're willing to work, but that's my decision. That's not your decision to distribute my property. Right, so uh, speaking of you being a lawyer, um, <laughs> I remember around a year ago after the gay marriage ruling, I, I understand totally your position on it, but it seemed to be that in that article, I think it was the Daily Wire, you said that the Supreme Court had done something unlawful because they had essentially, I think you called it judicial tyranny. I'm it is judicial sure. tyranny, yes. They, pushed, they, made it, they, they made every state, because it wasn't in the original, uh, in t the original intent of the 14th Amendment didn't pertain to gay people, and you're an originalist. I no, think. it's not that it didn't pertain to gay people. It's that the, the, the 14th Amendment to the Constitution suggests that there has to be equal protection under the laws. It doesn't mean that the effect of every law has